So I'm showing the, um, the platform that we went over earlier. So what you'll see inside JWebinar Prep Pipeline Product Session are a set of notebooks. You have a live version and a solutions version for part one, two, and three. So the notebooks that you should be looking at are the ones that say solutions. So we'll start with part one, and you can open part one solutions. And those are the ones that have the cells filled out for you already. Um, I think it'll be a little bit easier for you to follow along as I type the code. Um, and there are a few exercises for you to try all of this out on your own. So go ahead and open up part one solutions. And so in each notebook, they're all organized the same way, all three. There's a goals section at the top of the notebook for folks who um, might be looking at these outside of our webinar to remind you about what the goal of the notebook is. Um, so in this notebook, as I said, we're gonna start exploring JWST data products using some different tools, including becoming familiar with the data models. And then uh, we'll do a couple of exercises in this notebook as well, so you can take a look yourselves. Each notebook has a table of contents, and they all have an introduction and a pointer to resources and a reminder about data in MAST. Okay, and then as Cami and Jacob mentioned, there's different ways to run the cells in this notebook. You can hit this little button up here that says run the selected cells in advance, or you can come up to this corner over here, and click run, and you can run selected cells or you can click on a cell and hit shift return, um, which is uh, probably the easiest way to do it. Okay, and so um, for any of the exercises in the notebooks, your exercise solutions are at the bottom. So even in the solutions notebooks, the exercises remain empty, but you can find those at the bottom of the notebooks. Great, so let's get started taking a look at some JWST data. We're going to use an uncalibrated NearCam simulation for this exercise. And so, um, like Carl mentioned, JWST is pretty complex. Um, there's four instruments and lots of modes, so there's a, a lot to learn about the different types of data products and their formats. Um, and there's a lot of different tools out there for you. So a lot of that information is contained in the notebooks, probably more than you need, so feel free to use these as a reference um, outside of this webinar. Most of the data products are going to be in FITS format, which might be familiar to some of you, but there's also extra input and output files for the pipeline that aren't. So JWST associations, the things that associate different observations of a program, things like science data and background data, those are JSON files. ASDF files are used for the pipeline configuration files. Those are what control the parameters and the steps that get run in the pipeline. And then finally, you also have ECSV files. So all of your source catalogs that come out of stage three are going to be in ECSV format. And those are discussed in the third notebook. So here are the resources that we mentioned. Those are up here for you and the links will take you directly there. Um, we also have uh, a lot of linking throughout these notebooks to more information for you to dig into in your own time. And here I have put a little uh, reminder about MAST, and I've also put some information about standard data products that you'll get from MAST, along with the suffixes for the files. So uncalibrated raw data will be uncal.fits. And so you can see here, uncal.fits. Um, and then as you proceed through the pipeline, these are the suffixes that will, uh, that the different files will have. So let's start. Let's go ahead and uh, run the first several cells. These are things, uh, we're importing the packages that we need, in particular JWST data models and AstroPy tools. We have some convenience functions defined here for you. Um, these are just to make it easier down the road. We create images, plot ramps, Let's grab our raw exposure that I mentioned. And here we're going to look at it with FITS tools, FITS.info. And the name of our file is uncalobs. So the file names are all right here in the 
Excel that you use to download the data. So this is our uncalibrated file and our example file. So when you do fits.info, uncal obs, and run the cell, you'll see the typical extensions for a JWST data file. You have the primary extension. So this is where the bulk of your header information is going to be, all of the information about your, um, uh, your exposure, things like the um, target information, all of your exposure parameters, the instrument configuration, that will all be in the primary header. The science extension is what contains all of your science data, and there's also some science headers in that extension. And so you can see here typical, um, the typical shape of data for JWST. You have the size of the detector, the number of groups, and the number of integrations, as Carl was mentioning when we talked about up the ramp sampling. When you have grouped data, um, in other words, when you have frames that get averaged into a group um, as you're reading out information from the detector, you'll also get the first frame saved separately in the zero frame extension. And this is just an extra data point for you to have. You also have a group extension typically, and finally an ASDF extension. And so the ASDF extension is where all the model metadata is. Um, and also where the WCS will be stored. <clears throat> and then depending on the um, instrument mode, you'll also see int times tables, um, and there may be some other extensions. But for the most part, this is the general format of a JWST exposure, if you're looking at it with FITS. You can grab the data, the science data, to examine it. We'll call it science data. And we'll use fits.getData for our uncal odds. Here I'm calling the science extension, this one here. You can also type primary, since it's the first extension here. You can also use one. And let's look at the shape. You can see here, this matches what we described above. One integration, five groups, the full near cam detector. <clears throat> um, I put a link here for the up the ramp sampling if you want to read more about that. Um, Okay, and so that's the general format, but let's switch to take a look at some of the headers here. And so you can get all of the primary headers using fits.getheader. We'll also grab some science headers just as an example. All of those primary headers, so you can see what I'm talking about. So here you have your program information, all of your observation identifiers, target information, instrument configuration, exposure parameters, a subarray parameters that goes on for quite a while. You can search through FITS headers with a wildcard asterisk. So for instance, if you want to find any headers that might be related to OBS, but you're not sure what you're looking for, you can use the asterisk. And so it shows you these are all the headers with OBS in them. And we can use that to say, what's the observation ID? Oops, sorry. Okay, instrument. And the exposure type. Only eight characters allowed, which is why we have instrument. So here you have your observation ID, this is near cam, and this is a near cam image. And so the exposure type, um, this is what tells you what mode is being used. That's what controls the path through the pipeline and the calibration steps that get run for the most part. So we know the data dimensions from looking at the science data, but where is this in the headers, the primary headers? You have an ints. A shape. So all of that is contained in the primary headers. So that's the general format of the FITS files, um, but what does this actually look like? Uh, so Carl showed you some slides about up the ramp sampling, and we've talked about frames and groups. 
but what if we take a look at one integration for a particular pixel and look up the ramp? And then we'll take a look at one group that shows the full detector image. So here, let's choose a particular integration. So let's grab the first one. These are zero indexed. We'll choose a random pixel. I'm going to choose the last group. I can indicate that I want the last group with the minus one. Um, or in this case, I know how many groups I have. So if I want the last group, I would choose four because they're zero indexed. And let's set up our x-axis to plot. We're going to put groups on the x-axis. So I'm going to go from zero, the number of groups. Then my y-axis is going to be the actual signal up the ramp. So I'm going to get that from the science data. data the science data for the integration that I chose. I'm looking at all groups, and I want my particular pixel. Let's plot the ramp using our convenience function, groups on the x-axis, y. So here you can see in units of dn, as Carl mentioned, and then you have all of the groups here. Similarly, if we want to take a look at one group looks like a slice uh, across the whole detector, we can create an image of our science data for a particular integration and group. We want all of the pixels. This is a near cam exposure. This is what our detectors look like before we've removed all of the detector characteristics from it. Um, you can see the four different amplifiers, but you can also see some of the stars are shining through. And so those are all the things that will get removed when it goes through the pipe. Um, let's take a look at JWST data models. Um, so as I mentioned before, these are essentially containers to help make your life easier um, when, when you're working with both JWST data and software. Um, and so there's different models for different kinds of data. Um, and, but each one generally has um, these main arrays associated with it, so associated with them. So you have a data array, a data quality array, and an error array. And similarly to how we were using FITS, you can always use model.info to look at the contents of a data model. And that kind of renders the underlying um, container information, shows you the, the data arrays and metadata and things like that. So for the current models, there are quite a lot of them. Um, and uh, for instance, if you want to uh, use data that's compatible with stage one pipeline, so um, the pipeline that does all the detector corrections for you, you would want to use um, the uh, ramp model, since that's the model for up the ramp sampled data. Or if you just have a 2D image that you want to feed into data analysis tools, you could use the image model. But the software developers um, also built in the functionality that if you're not sure, you can just let the data model package guess for you. Um, and I can show you that in a couple of cells. I also have a full list or a link to the full list of current models in the pipeline read the docs here, or you can get it programmatically if that's um, something you'd rather do. And so let's just open up an empty ramp model here and take a look at what the ramp model looks like. As we said, the ramp model is what's used for something like our uncalibrated data file that we're using. So this is a completely empty model. Um, you have the data, the pixel data quality, the group data quality, the error array. There's no shape to it because there's no data in there. Um, we're just looking at an empty model, but um, this gives you the data type as well that it's expecting. So if you tried to read um, the wrong data type in here, it won't work. And so now let's um, put something into our model. So let's revisit our format, but this time we're going to use a data model to examine it. So we'll say model equals data models dot open. So let's pretend I don't know that I need a ramp model here. We'll just let the package guess for us.
you can see now, instead, my ramp model is populated with the information from our file. So you have the data, one in integration, five groups in the full detector. You have five groups in the group extension, all of the metadata. So this is where all the headers, header information goes, our zero frame, and then our data quality arrays and our error array. And so that automatically gets populated when you put the file in there. It double checks these data types, it populates the headers, or, as we said, we know that it's a ramp, so we can just open the ramp model. Here it's exactly the same, because the data model package knows that this is a ramp. And you get the science data similarly to how we did for FITS. So we can say, our science data this time is going to be model.data. And it's dot data because we have our data extension here. So here's our science data shape. That makes sense. We can create an image just like we did before. It works the same. The metadata is where I really think the data models are quite handy. Um, in order to show you what the framework looks like, let's look at the schema. You can see here, this is just an ordered dictionary of information. Um, I always have a hard time finding a good example on the spot. Let's see. So you can see here, um, for the different entries, you have the data type expected. Um, so, for instance, for the time obs keyword, it tells you the fits keyword, it tells you what's, what it's expecting in the data type. So each time you read in a header, it checks these things to make sure it matches what it's expected, because these are what the pipeline expects or the data analysis tools are expecting. They're really easy to search as well, so you can search the whole schema. for target information. So these are all of the target um, headers that you could potentially fill out or that might get filled out when you read in an exposure. Or you can use the uh, key. Okay, we're looking for anything related to the deck. And so this will show you, you have deck V1 for the pointing, you have the target deck, and the WCS info. And it also tells you the expected data type for these. Or if you want to just look at them all at once, as we did before, it prints out all of the information. So you have filter, um, the instrument name, pupil, et cetera, your observation information, visit information. So that continues. I mentioned before, the data models check to make sure that um, you're reading in something that it's expecting. So as an example, we have our target RA. What if we try to change this to a string? Then we get a warning, and it tells us that when we change this to a string, it's not of type number, and our schema is expecting this to be a number. Um, it tells you the associated fits keyword. And so this helps to make sure everything stays consistent. So here, I'm just going to change it back. So what if I'm used to working with fits and I only know the fits keyword? Well, there's a function to help you with that. If I can type. Say we want to find the date of our observation. This is where you go to find it in the data model. So it's in model.meta.observation.date. 